story of an American air operation. One small campaign in the greatest aerial offensive of this war. In a sense, it is more than the story of a military operation. These planes, high in the skies over Germany, were a symbol of the unshakable unity of the Allies in their determination to fight together until victory and peace had been achieved. June 2nd, 1944. On this day, 650 American flying fortresses inflicted severe damage on German defenses along the invasion coast. Farther north, 300 American liberators bombed military installations in German-occupied northwestern Europe. was heavy over some targets. Eight of our planes did not return to their bases. On this same day, June 2nd, 1944, a task force of 150 flying fortresses, escorted by 70 fighter planes, attacked railroad and marshalling yards at Debritz in Hungary. None of these planes returned to their bases on this day. June 21st, 1944. 300 liberators bombed the Focke-Wulf 190 engine factory at Bosdorf, Germany. An hour later, 800 flying fortresses attacked targets at Berlin, Germany. Damage was inflicted on railway stations, freight yards and factories. Bombs were also dropped on the ministries of war and propaganda, as well as Gestapo headquarters. Over all these targets, flak was intense and accurate. Interception strong and determined. returned to their bases. And on this same day, at about the same time, 155 flying fortresses, escorted by fighters, bombed synthetic oil plants and refineries at Ruland, 70 miles east of Leipzig, Germany. As on June 2nd, None of these planes returned to their bases on this day. This was not a coincidence, and these planes were not lost in action. This had been decided six months before, on December 7, 1943, when at Tehran, the leaders of the three major Allied powers had declared their complete agreement as to the scope and timing of operations from the east, west, and south. Operations from the east, west, and south. Operations on land, on sea, and in the air. The USSR agrees to furnish bases in Russia for the use of the US strategical air forces in Europe, such bases to be used for shuttle bombing operations. Operation Titanic. Shuttle bombing. With American air bases in Russia, our bombers based in England and Italy could attack objectives in Central Europe, the Balkans, or Eastern Germany, land in Russia, refuel, reload, and bomb additional enemy targets on their return trips to their home bases. Operation Titanic. A triangular superhighway in the sky. With shuttle bombing, 
flying distances from England to some extreme points in eastern Germany and Poland, and from Italy to some points in German-occupied Hungary and the Balkans, would be reduced by a third. Reduced flying distance means reduced danger. For while planes on the shuttle route would have already landed, planes making the round-trip run still have to face flak, interception, or engine failure. With shuttle bombing, strategic targets of importance to the Red Army could be bombed by American planes operating from Russian bases. With shuttle bombing, Germany and the Luftwaffe could never be quite sure where the next Allied air blow was coming from or going to. With shuttle bombing, the coalition land war, crushing the Wehrmacht on three fronts, would take wings to become coalition air war and there would be no target in Germany or German-occupied Europe American planes could not seek, find, and destroy. These were the strategic purposes of Operation Titanic. The task of achieving these purposes was assigned to Lieutenant General Carl A. Spatz, Commanding General of the United States Strategic Air Forces in Europe, and became the responsibility of Major General Frederick L. Anderson, Deputy Commanding General for Operations. In four months, the new bases were to be selected, constructed, supplied, staffed, and ready for use. A problem in men, materiel, space, time, and secrecy. Requiring food, gasoline, bombs, ammunition, trucks, jeeps, steel matting, and more than 20,000 tons of other equipment. To be shipped by convoy from Liverpool and other British ports, through the North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans. 2,000 miles of submarine-infested waters. Then from Murmansk, the Soviet's Arctic ice-free port, by rail. An additional 2,000 miles. Radio equipment to be flown by ATC from the United States to Russia a distance of 5,000 miles. Oil and more gasoline by tank car from Iran and British surplus stocks in the Middle East, 3,000 miles. A task force of expert ground crews transported from the United Kingdom to Cairo through the South Atlantic and the Mediterranean. By rail from Egypt to Palestine. By motor convoy through the Holy Land and Iraq. Then up and over the snow-covered mountains of northern Persia to the southernmost end of the Russian Transcaucasian Railroad at Tabriz. Finally, by special train over the Caucasian mountains to their new headquarters somewhere in Russia. A secret journey of more than 7,000 miles. By the end of four months, the bases were ready and Ambassador Averill W. Harriman and Major General John R. Dean, head of the United States military mission at Moscow, landed on the first American air base on Russian soil. Now, with preparation and organization completed, the task of transforming theory into reality was assigned to the 8th American Air Force, based somewhere in England, and the 15th Air Force, based somewhere in Italy. Early in the morning of June 2nd, Crews of bomber and fighter commands of the 15th Air Force were assembled to be briefed for a special mission. A special mission for pilots, navigators, bombardiers, and gunners. And finally, a special word of farewell from Major General Twining, Commanding General of the 15th Air Force. I do not have to impress you with the importance of this mission to the Russian base. I'm sure you are fully aware of this important event. I would like to mention one thing about which you must be very particular. That is your conduct while at these Russian bases. Be soldierly and neat at all times. The Russian is a fine soldier who appreciates results and one who does not understand big talk. I wish you the best of luck. Goodbye. <laughs> hours the bombers took off 
with Lieutenant General Ira C. Aker, Commanding General of the Mediterranean Allied Air Forces, in personal command of the task force, the fortresses left the ground with clockwork precision. One fort every 30 seconds. At 0630 hours, their fighter escort followed them into the air. 70 planes in 17 and a half minutes. At 0730 hours, the bombers and the first relay of fighters made rendezvous over the Adriatic, and Titanic I was on its way. If the shuttle route to Russia was equally practical from England, was now to be proved by the 8th Air Force. Oh, 100 hours. The morning of June 21st. Somewhere in England. Titanic II. At 0530 hours, the heavily loaded bombers took off into the fog of an English dawn. 24 minutes later, the first group was in the air, heading northeast to the task force assembly point. At 0800 hours, two by two, the last relay of fighters left the ground. At 0930 hours, flying fortresses and Mustangs made rendezvous high over the German coast, and Titanic II was on its way. At 1,200 hours, it dropped its bombs on the Ruland oil fields and continued to its new bases somewhere in Russia. That is why on June 2nd, and again on June 21st, American planes did not return to their bases somewhere in Italy or England. For on each of those days, their mission was still unfinished. In a sense, it had only begun. Fifteen hundred hours. What was left of our target was a good three hours behind us. But we were still in enemy skies, and we could see the P-51s that were escorting us all the way in prowling in the skies above. They called us Big Friend. We called them Little Friend. And it was a very pleasant feeling to have them around. About 1,600 hours, we saw our red-nosed little friends pull away. A couple of minutes later, our navigator, the little man with the big maps, made with the instruments, and gave us the good word. Navigator to crew. Navigator to crew. It won't be long now. We're over Russia. Over Russia. From the sky, all countries look alike. But this was friendly country. That meant no more flag, no danger of interception. Solid ground not too far away. It meant a new country, a new people. A lies we'd heard about, read about, but never seen. How do you get along with people you can't even talk to? Would we like them? Would they like us? Coming in, Base X looked like any other American airfield. 
neat rows of GI tents. Runways dotted with B-17s. Ground crews at the edge of the field, their faces to the sky. One difference, though, the ruins all around the base. A silent reminder that enemy boots had marched in two directions here quite recently. each other down, a third of a world away from home. Wheels made in Akron, touch steel matting made in Pittsburgh on an American landing field in Russia. Gower, Messick, Ostrander, Zafak, Malone, Schultz, Badowski, Travers, McGee, Stanley, Rudenstein, Betts. A thousand tourists from 48 states on a short visit between two jobs. Tense moment in international relations. Ivan Ivanovich meets Fearless Fosdick. A handshake says, hello, very glad to see you in any language. And General Permanov makes it official. I welcome you as fighting allies. Together, we'll fight to victory. I wish you the best of luck in combat and a safe return home. After that, there was another important ceremony. Short snorter bills. If we didn't get those signed, the flight would have been illegal. Whenever flyers meet, they talk shop, even when they can't understand each other. That's when sign language came in handy. And it seemed to work at that. Some Russian wax officers and enlisted women were on the welcoming committee, too. It would have been nice to sort of pursue the subject further, but there was work to be done. Interrogation, the reports and odds and ends of information that lay the groundwork for future operations. Interrogation is held in the open by courtesy of retreating German troops. Did you meet any fighter opposition? Yes. All right. How many fighters did you see? I said about 15. About 15? Yeah. Good. With interrogation over, the men head for the tents, which will be their home as long as they remain in Russia. The first half of the mission is ended. The second half has already begun. Without the loss of an hour, the mixed ground crews of American and Russian mechanics take over the big bombers. Inspecting damages. Checking engines. Repairing equipment. Getting the fortresses ready for another trip. Спасибо. Кухня. Кухня stands for kitchen. Kitchen stands for chow. And even in Russia, you stand in line for it. On KP duty, Katya, Manya, and Alga. Not Buck or Eddie or Pete, but soldiers too. And darn good cooks to boot, who cooked and served our supper. Hutch. Pajalista. K ration with a Russian accent, and spam a la stroganoff. The coffee was hot. That's about all you could say for it. The name was Mashinka. Back at the field, the ground crew stayed with the bombers as long as there was light, making sure that nothing happened that shouldn't when the B-17s went up again. 2100 hours, nine in the evening, somewhere in Russia. It's noon in Leominster, Massachusetts, lunchtime. It's 10 in the morning in Paragould, Arkansas. The sun is climbing high. 
In Los Angeles, California, the day is just beginning. The same day, just ending, somewhere in Russia. Small world. <laughs> Another day, just beginning, somewhere in Russia. Another working day. Another day of war. At headquarters, American officers headed by Colonel, now General, Albert A. Kessler and their Russian colleagues plan the next mission. Objective, the destruction of one of several strategic targets in the path of the Red Army. The target is selected. Weather permitting, mission tomorrow. A task force of this size needs gasoline, more than 350,000 gallons of it. Ammunition, more than a million rounds. Bombs, more than 500 tons. And more than 50,000 American and Russian man hours of servicing and preparation. While the ground crews got the forts and fighters ready, our time was our own. Some of the fellows took advantage of a sunny morning and put on an exhibition of the national pastime. Some thought they'd teach the Russians another American pastime. And learned that others had taught too well before them. Some tried to bridge the distance home. To let the folks know their wandering boy was somewhere in Russia last night. Some of us, over lunch of borscht and kasha, talked over tricks of the trade with the Russian fighter pilots, whose small, fast yaks are part of the field's defenses, constantly on the alert. Some tried to preserve the more exotic aspects of base X, like the American nurses that are stationed there, perfectly at home abroad. Some discussed with the Russians current events, literature, yeah. sports, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And art. Some moseyed over to a nearby pasture and found out that milking a cow in Russia is no different than it is in Iowa. And some of us, explorers at heart, decided to see Russia. Down near the base is a market center for the adjacent farming district, and a fair was held each year along its main street. The factory section. Principal industry, the manufacture of leather goods. The Ukrainian Museum, well known for its collection of historical treasures and valuable objects of art grave of the famous Ukrainian writer Karolenko and his home. The population of the town, 130,000 at the last census, has varied in recent years and there has been a certain decline in the number of children of school age. Those who have remained or who have returned from the interior have recently developed a fondness for an American import known as Chvachka. Translation, gum. On the way back to the base, a few miles from the town, there's a monument to a Russian victory over an invading army 200 years ago.
следующий номер. Украинские народные песни в исполнении хора имени Шевченко. Next number. Ukrainian folk songs by the Shevchenko Choir. The language and the music are strange, but it isn't necessary to understand the language to understand some of the people here. The show marks the beginning of the end of this American visit to Russia. Most of the men are already looking back, remembering. <laughs> Lieutenant John Morris, navigator of Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, who has the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with four clusters, was particularly impressed by the medals worn by the Russian soldiers. They don't wear ribbons like we do, but the actual medals. Practically every Russian soldier I ran into was loaded with decorations. Captain Percy W. Stressing, pilot of Rochester, New York, thought the show explained a lot about the Russian people. Those Russians sure like to sing and dance. One of the numbers was kind of a tap dance. I think the Russians resemble Americans in a lot of ways. They've got a great sense of humor. They can laugh and enjoy everything, even though their whole country is in ruins. Major Samuel Davis, command pilot of Boston, Massachusetts. It was good to relax and listen to music and laugh, but you could never forget there was a war on here. Most everybody was in uniform, men, women, even children. I saw a lot of kids who'd been through plenty of action. Some of them who had medals to prove it couldn't have been more than 10 or 12 years old. One of the other fellows told me he ran into one kid who'd been a sniper with the gorillas and had 21 notches on his rifle butt. A sniper with the gorillas at his age. Technical Sergeant Lewis Zernick, engineer gunner of Brooklyn, New York, spent a lot of time with the Russian ground crews. Some of them on the show, and quite a few on our base too, had been wounded as much as three or four times. They were working on a base for arrest before going back into combat. Those Russians sure have funny ideas about resting. Staff Sergeant John E. Gagan, tail gunner of Patterson, New Jersey. The show was pretty good. As far as I could see, everybody liked it, including General Aker. He was sitting in the first row with General Perm, uh, Permanoff or something like that. The Russian base commander. Lieutenant John McKenzie, bombardier of Paragould, Arkansas. Something I'll remember for a long time were the Russian kids. You got the feeling some of them never had a childhood. They had such old faces. They were pretty shy, most of them, but they seemed to like us. slow and sentimental, mostly waltzes. The girls do all kinds of jobs around the base, and they work very hard. Their clothes are plain and neat. They don't use makeup as a rule, but some of them wear lipstick. I remember one girl who was in charge of an ACAC crew. She had 12 enemy planes to her credit. Staff Sergeant Donald Craw, tail gunner of Stratford, Connecticut. The music at the dance was on the corny side. But the girls are nice. I met a girl from Leningrad whose father was a general. She taught me some Russian words, and I taught her some American slang. It didn't take long before I was saying, horror shaw, and she was saying, OK, bud.
Weather? Okay. Take off, 0900 hours. Taxi out, 0845. Stations, 0840. Briefing, 0600 hours. Briefing. Zero hour, 1320. Your altitude will be 22,000 feet, which is your bombing altitude. And the place will be the target. Target for today. It may be a locomotive works in Poland, an airdrome in Hungary, an oil field in Romania, or a tank factory in Germany itself. Whatever the target, today's mission will prove again that no objective in German Europe is secure from American bombers. Your group and wing assembly will be at 12,000 feet over the base. Your bombing altitude will be 22,000 feet. We'll pick up our fighter escort over the front at 11.43. Target time, 13.20. Gas load, 2,700. Bomb load, 10 500-pound GPs. Bomb load, 10 500-pound GPs. GP, general purpose. General purpose, to reduce the enemy's mobility, to disrupt his lines of communication, reinforcement, and supply, to destroy his war machine at its very source, his mines, his mills, his factories and to deliver a message. That means, good luck, we'll be seeing you. to and from Russia over this aerial highway. In less than four months, 24 targets in Germany and German-held territories, some never before within effective range of our bombers, felt the lash of American air power, striking against railway centers and marshalling yards at Debrecen and Solnok, Hungary, Bucharest, and Erin, Romania, and Bezier, France against airdromes at Galax, Foxani, Buzal, and Celestia, Romania, Mielec, Poland, Kaskamesh, Hungary, and Toulouse, France, against oil fields and refineries at Rulan, Germany, Prohovich, and Terzabina, Poland, Budapest, Hungary, and Boyesti, Romania, against armament plants and aircraft factories at Gdynia, Poland, Miskolc, 
and Diosbjör, Hungary, and Chemnitz, Germany. But even more important, this bomb and 10,000 more like it destroyed more than German factories, German oil depots, German railroads. They smashed Germany's last hope of escaping defeat by dividing the Allies. Never before have the major Allies been more closely united, and they're determined to continue to be united so that the ideal of lasting peace will become a reality.